Pray with me, please. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I just thank you, Lord, for all that you've done in bringing us this very important message. Lord, I pray that our eyes will be open, our ears will be open, also our hearts and our minds, that we might receive what you have for us today. In Jesus' name, amen. Before we get started, let's review. Lesson one, we saw that John establishes that Jesus is God, and those who believe Jesus may have eternal life. In lesson two, we saw that Jesus began his uh, earthly ministry with a miracle at a wedding in Cana. He turned water into the best wine. Today, lesson three. It's entitled, The Most Important Question. If you would, please open your Bibles to John chapter three and meet me in verse 22. All references today will be to the New American Standard, unless otherwise noted. The outline for our lesson today, Jesus up, is upheld as the Christ in John chapter 3, verses 22 through 36. Jesus offers eternal life in John chapter 4, verses 1 through 26. And Jesus prepares the harvest in John chapter 4, verses 27 through 45. Imagine this week that you are expecting either a marriage proposal or to be offered your dream job. But before that can happen, you receive a phone call. It's the doctor's office, and they're asking you to come in for a second appointment. When you arrive at the doctor's office, they call you back, and you're sitting there, and you see the doctor's lips moving, but all you hear is cancer. Stage four, it's metastasized to the bone. What do you think on that day is the most important question? Is it, will you marry me? Or will you take a job? Neither of these questions really seem to matter in light of the gravity of what I've just explained. The most important question to answer today is this. Where will you spend eternity? Jesus is upheld as the Christ in John chapter 3, verse 22. Our lesson begins after an encounter with Nicodemus. Jesus and his disciples went to Judea, and verses 22 through 24 give us some background or context. Look what's happening. Two groups are baptizing, John and his disciples, and Jesus but not really Jesus, it's his disciples who are baptizing. According to verses 25 through 26, this presented a problem for John's disciples. A discussion arose after a Jew inquired about purification, which is baptism. It instigated the problem that we see in verse 26. And they came to John and said to him, Rabbi, he who was with you Beyond the Jordan, to whom you have testified, behold, he is baptizing, all and all are coming to him. John's disciples were feeling threatened and protected, protective of John's ministry. The men were acting territorial by giving their wholehearted devotion and loyalty to John. But what was John's reaction? The answer is found in John chapter 3, Verses 27 through 36. John's character is on full display. He is unequivocal in verse 28. You yourselves are my witnesses that I said, I am not the Christ, but I have been sent ahead of him. John adamantly rejects his disciples' misplaced affections by pointing them away from him and towards Jesus. Who do people say is the one you follow? Who do you testify most about? Would your friends, family, and acquaintances say it's a particular church, it's a particular Bible study, or maybe a favorite Bible teacher? You must heed John's warning. No one or ministry should ever be praised more highly or more often than our Lord. 
our allegiance is first and foremost to him. Despite the praises from man, John is a paragon of humility. John had no selfish ambitions of greatness. He lived and ultimately died fully abandoned to God. In Matthew 14, there's a record of John the Baptist's suffering and death based on his convictions. He was arrested, imprisoned, and ultimately beheaded for publicly calling out Herod's sin. You see, Herod had married his brother's wife, and he thought he was above the moral law. This was a sin against and before a holy God. Did you answer the digging deeper question about John this week? If you didn't, please consider doing that so that you can see the full scope of John's ministry. What would you do in John's place? Author Ted Decker asks a provocative question in his novel, The Martyr's Song. What would you die for? A small group of women and children in Bosnia at the end of World War II faced the same question John the Baptist, John the Baptizer answered. They saw in the faces of the enemy soldiers pure evil that hurt them. Decker writes, it is then in the midst of chaos and pain that the martyr's song is first heard. It is then that the window into heaven first opens. Committed to a, to a single overriding objective, John gave all he had to mission, to the mission and ministry of Jesus Christ. The forerunner understood his role in God's plan. John is quoted in verse 30 saying, he must increase, but I must decrease. And always listed in verse 29 and verses 31 through 36, John points to Christ who is the Old Testament fulfillment of prophecy. Look at verse 29. It's both a beautiful illustration and a prophetic imagery of eternity future. The picture is of Jesus as the bridegroom. He's a foreshadowing of a specific event during the end times. Jesus will return to claim his bride, the church, and take her out of this evil world ruled by Satan. Now look at verse 31. This is a look at eternity past. Jesus came from heaven where he dwelt from the beginning. We learn that in John 1.1. And he has authority over all creation. This statement emphatically reiterates that Jesus is God and this is a reference to Christ's deity. If you notice verses 32 and 33, they tell us that many reject Jesus while others accept what he says is true. Well, the, ch the chapter, chapter three, climaxes with two major truths. The first one is a statement about the Trinitarian God of the Bible. And we see that in ver John chapter three, verses 34 and 35. For he whom God has sent speaks the words of God, for he gives the spirit without measure. The Father loves the Son and has given all things into his hand. This is a clear picture of the Trinity, and I've brought a definition for you. The Trinity is a theological term used to de define God as an undivided unity expressed in the threefold nature of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. While the term Trinity does not appear in the scriptures, the Trinitarian structure appears throughout the New Testament to affirm that God himself, through Jesus Christ, is God himself, to affirm that God himself is manifested through Jesus Christ by means of the Spirit. That was a lot to get out. So glad I had it there so that you could see it yourself. The second, second statement is about humanity. It's found in verse 36, and there's a promise. He who believes in the Son has eternal life, but he who does not obey the Son will not see life but the wrath of God abides in him. The word obey ties back to verses 32 and 33. There's a stark contrast between the one who accepts and the one who rejects. Therefore, where a person spends eternity depends on a personal decision. Whether we 
obey Jesus, by believing his words for salvation, or not. Jesus is trustworthy, and his words are true for both the person who accepts and the person who rejects him. Verse 34 tells us that Jesus speaks the very words of God, and in verse 36 we learn that the only way to have eternal life is to believe in the Son. Salvation is deliverance from the wrath of God. But the one who rejects the Son will not have life. Instead, all who reject Christ will suffer the wrath of God. What is the wrath of God? It's judgment. It's the unfathomable and irreversible state of eternal separation from God. Believe in Jesus, God's Son, to have eternal life. 